one of Australia's major contributions to world trade, has its fiery origin in the coastal cane fields of Eastern Australia. But more than 75% of this important industry is located in the tropical regions of North Queensland. Once the cane is harvested and crushed, the bulk raw sugar is hauled along a network of narrow gauge railways to the giant sugar terminals. Here at Lucinda, the construction of a $20 million storage shed was the first stage of its upgrading to a major bulk sugar port. Next, the longest conveyor in the world over the sea would be constructed to transport the raw sugar 5.76 kilometers to a modern offshore berth capable of loading ships of 40,000 tons. This $30 million development is the Transfield Queensland Lucinda project. The port of Lucinda, cut off from deep water access by sandbars and shallow winding channels, was previously restricted to small sugar vessels of 6,000 tonnes. To cater for direct, large overseas shipments, the berth had to be relocated in natural deep water off the coast. In January 1977, the major contractor, Transfield Queensland, established its worksite adjacent to the port. This special waterfront work area was reclaimed from mangrove swamp and surfaced with gravel to store the huge volume of materials to be transported, assembled and erected offshore. The pile yard was located on the edge of the Hinchinbrook Channel. Here a pile welding plant was built to allow the submerged arc welding of 9 metre sections into piles averaging 40 metres in length. In all, 1,000 piles with a total length of almost 34,000 metres would be fabricated in this way. After welding, the ends were sealed and the piles were launched. False work piles were driven offshore in March 1977 from Transfield's well-known crane barge, Aquila. These approach jetty piles were designed to carry a load of 300 tons. They were cut off to level and slotted to accept the pre-painted rectangular hollow steel headstock. One design innovation here was the method of joining the steel piles to the headstocks, avoiding the need for the usual heavy diaphragm plates and large weldments. After welding, the joint was sandblasted and painted with a tar epoxy system, ensuring continuous anti-corrosion protection. The approach jetty was constructed from two faces simultaneously. One crew working from the shore, another from a point three kilometers offshore both heading out to sea where a third crew was constructing the loading wharf. Uh, this was necessary to complete the project within the tight 25-month start-to-finish deadline. Exactly. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 
point there and point to me. Can't go wrong. The weather and the sea posed special problems on this project. Because of the great distance between the site extremities, the weather onshore was sometimes different to that offshore. Most of the work was in exposed conditions, and many of the men won't forget the experience working just meters above the wind-whipped waves of the Coral Sea. However, the construction methods ensured that the materials reached the workplace in all but the most extreme weather conditions. Transfield established its own casting yard in the work area complex to pre-cast some 1,500 concrete girders used for making the approach jetty roadway. Two casting beds were set up parallel to each other and covered with a novel swing-away roof to protect the men from the weather and later to swing away for the girders to be lifted out. The casting yard team produced four girders a day, six days a week. Stressing with a long stroke single strand jack was done under shelter from one end only. This jack was carried in a two wheel trolley with a hand winch to provide vertical adjustment to allow stressing of top and bottom cables. The girders were then stacked and water cured for seven days. Sea transport soon became the preferred method of moving the girders to the approach jetty, using one of three specially constructed steel barges of 90 tons capacity. Another design innovation of the project was the use of two travelling construction bridges which could cantilever over the jetty. On top was a gantry carrying the 90-ton liner crane. The whole bridge was moved fore and aft by a system of wire ropes and pulleys with the liner crane providing the winching capability. In front was a pair of pinned pile gates the bridge, 60 metres long and weighing 120 tonnes, was completely self-contained with welding machines, air compressors, crew shed, stores and pile hammer. All approach jetty construction work was done from this bridge, including pile driving, the placing of the headstocks, conveyor galleries and concrete deck girders. In August 1977, the deck was placed on span 157, three kilometres from the shore, linking the two sections of the approach jetty. For the construction teams, it was a milestone. It was now possible to travel five kilometres out to sea. The project was ahead of schedule. There was reason to celebrate. 
Not yet with champagne, just a stubby. The final link-up was yet to come. More than 100 men worked on the Lucinda project. Some were locals, some were from other states, some from other nations. Very few had any previous offshore work experience, but on-site training programs soon overcame this. With them went all their daily requirements. Going to work meant a 30-minute ferry ride out to sea. This concrete mixer is operating three kilometers offshore and all its daily requirements too must come by barge, even the fresh water. Once on the job, however, the construction work would be like any other. Well, almost. No one here should complain of their surroundings. Beautiful scenery, balmy tropical days, fresh sea breezes. The new loading wharf, located in 14 metres of water, is an open grid steel structure designed to support the shipping gallery, concrete roadway and ship loader. The wharf construction progressed southwards, using the 90-ton Lima crane to drive the raking piles and erect steel girders. This crane moved on stands, which it lifted from bent to bent, building its own road. It even managed to turn completely round in this narrow area to work its way back driving a third row of piles. In 18 months, it travelled only one kilometre. As the wharf structure was completed, the precast concrete decking was placed, and the transfer tower superstructure was erected with another mobile crane, with all components shipped out by barge or boat. Of course, no mention was made in the official contract about fishing time. Mention fishing and nobody would know a thing until the cameraman caught this happy group. But of course, every job has its perks. Most of the steel for the project was fabricated in Brisbane and trucked to Lucinda. Before transport, some was fully painted, some only primed. Both systems proved unsatisfactory and the whole of the structural steel was repainted on the site to a very demanding specification by specially trained applicators. The construction program required that every week two bents of approach jetty were completed by each crew. Frequently this target was exceeded and sometimes doubled. In one extraordinary week the two erection crews completed 11 bents or 220 meters of completed structure in six days an achievement believed to be a world record. The credit for success like this extends beyond the offshore crews to their onshore counterparts who cast the girders, assembled the galleries and supplied the piles. Indeed, to all the workers and subcontractors. Not all the piles were rolled into the water as it was found necessary to launch some at low tide. These were first sealed with a standard tire 
and then towed on a special bogey to be launched down a concrete ramp. In August 1978, 18 months into the project, final join-up was now very close. With two sections of the approach jetty linked, one construction bridge and its crew had almost completed its task. Its next journey would be back to shore. From shore to ship, the sugar will ride to sea within aluminium-clad galleries. One gallery truss reached the worksite each day from Cairns, 300 kilometers to the north. Several teams then moved in to fix the aluminium floors and cladding, which totally enclosed the gallery. The cable trays, fire main and hydrant points, and the conveyor idlers were all fitted before the completed unit was barged out to the approach jetty. Told, 285 conveyor galleries, each 20 meters long, were required to complete the approach jetty. Because the finished structure would be a tourist attraction for the district, the shoreward side of the gallery was clad in gold anodized aluminium for a distance of one kilometer from the beach to reduce the glare. In contrast to the conveyor galleries, the shiploader galleries were prefabricated in Transfields factories in Sydney and Brisbane and then trucked to Lucinda. They were assembled, sandblasted and painted before being barged out to the loading wharf. The assemblies were erected in sections 10 meters long to form the shipping gallery 20 meters above water. All piles above low water and other steelwork subject to saltwater wetting are protected with a tar epoxy coating. Piles below low water level 
have a permanent impressed current system of cathodic protection. This prevents the steel from chemically reacting with oxygen to form rust. The precast concrete decking for the wharf was cast by Humes in Townsville, 120 kilometers away, and trucked to Lucinda before being barged out. Because of the short contract time available, an unusual technique was used in the construction of the ship loader. It was fabricated in Transfield Seven Hills factory, where it was trial erected, dismantled and prime painted before trucking to Lucinda. The 130 ton ship loader A-frame was lifted and carried by Transfield's crane barge to its position on its bogies on the loading wharf. Then followed the placement of the 33 meter boom onto its bearing mounts on the A-frame. For all those involved in the Lucinda project, nothing could match the anticipation of a successful join-up. The celebrations for join-up ceremony were hosted by the chairman of Transfield, Queensland, Mr. Franco Belgiorno Nettis. In September 1978, after 18 hectic months, the final precast girders were placed in position. After allowing two and a half meters for the curvature of the earth, the approach jetty was true to line, level and distance. During the construction period, there had been floods, torrential rain, storms and cyclones. The project was still well ahead of schedule. The engineering concepts and designs of McDonald, Wagner and Priddle and CSR Limited had been justified. The construction methods of Transfield, Queensland had been proven. A roadway links the shore. The days of limited access by sea are over. The shipping gallery drive tower is ready for its mechanicals and the gallery for cladding. The shiploader hydraulics, electricals and mechanicals will soon be ready for the belt. A Kobe 45 hammers home the last of the piles. The Lucinda project involved a number of outstanding achievements in the construction industry, including the installation of the longest conveyor in the world, 5,760 meters over the sea. The conveyor belt was made by Olympic in Melbourne, shipped to Townsville, trucked to Lucinda, unloaded at the tail end structure before being pulled out in 400 meter lengths. These were vulcanized into a single flight steel cord belt supported on suspended aluminium idlers. An eight ton hydraulic winch mounted on a rubber tired tractor hauled the conveyor belt in two separate sections the entire 5.76 kilometers to the transfer tower. The belt, 1.2 meters wide, can travel at 300 meters a minute and has a design capacity of 2,000 tons an hour.
The sugar is delivered via an eight and a half ton surge bin to the shipping gallery conveyor and then on to the shiploader, a journey of 22 minutes. In February 1979, 25 months after the contract was awarded, the first shipment of sugar was loaded. The biggest ships in the world sugar trade can load at the offshore wharf at Lucinda, considerably changing the pattern of shipping sugar from Queensland. celebrations, the tiny town of Lucinda welcomed its guest of honour, Mr Fraser, local, interstate and overseas guests representing the world sugar trade. To mark the occasion, Transfield Queensland's Managing Director, Mr John Panizza, presented Mr Fraser with a commemorative medal, specially cast at Transfield's Sculpture Foundry and bearing the logos of the project's main participants, the Harbour Corporation, CSR Limited, McDonald, Wagner and Priddle and Transfield Queensland. Lucinda offshore, where the sugar rides to sea.